Welcome to the third and last part of the Sci-Fi Panel tutorial. Let's dive directly into our dynamically cut network and move on with our tool. We need a bit of space, so let's push the nodes a bit to the left. Then we need an attribute wrangler, where we can write our attributes in. Here we can directly build a switch, so we can choose the right input in each case based on our total of five versions. Basically, we will build our bool objects in a subnet. Channels are created for horizontal and vertical copies. My single triangle is brought into the initial position by using a transform, which I use to connect all the points in the subnet. In this case, a triangle was convenient. However, the geo will be dismissed later, and only the points will be used. This workflow is actually not procedural since the values are relatively fixed here. Ultimately, these values work just fine because they are just statically defined based on the appropriate values I tested. At this point, it is not necessary to be super flexible since the only nodes that need to be adjusted are the copy transform and the copy transform afterward. One is the horizontal copy, and the other is responsible for controlling the vertical copies. Here it is to be noted that we need some values which we use here again relatively statically, so just simply use the values here which works fine in any case. Otherwise you need to adjust the value yourself if you create an alternative object. The values I use are just the dimensions of the triangle. This triangle then has to be shifted to the right in the x-axis accordingly, and then the hole copied in the vertical plane. Here you can enter your channels and inputs, copy and paste the references. What I do then is with a match axis node to align the triangles again to the right position, and set it to zero with a transform. I move in a bit in Z, and that's it. These as mentioned, are just the triangle dimensions align in a way that I can later mirror them symmetrically. Don't forget to output the copy number as an attribute on the copy to SOP. In principle, we want to arrange our triangles in a way that they work like a pyramid. This is so that they match the shape we use to bool out of the main polygon. You will see what I mean in a moment. The critical thing is that we want to delete the last object or the last triangle accordingly to our line, and that for each further line increasingly. For the first row, we would like to delete nothing. For the second row, we would like to delete one triangle for the third row, then two and so on. We will then be able to specify the polygon that we want to delete. Let's get the row number for each primitive. Subtract the row from our total prims and delete the current prim if it's bigger than our prim we want to delete by an if statement. And it's of course num prim and not prim num. The good thing is, we can copy our code directly into the other loop. The only thing we have to change is that we don't subtract minus one but minus two. And now we can see that it works which means on the first row the last polygon is not deleted. In the second row the last polygon is in fact deleted, and in the following row the last two polygons are deleted and so on. The question is now of course why we need the whole thing procedural at all, and the answer is first it is cool, and second is because of our cutting lengths that we will build up for the longest curve, where we have in principle five different lengths that we can cut out. On the basis of these lengths we need correspondingly, also these whole grids, and to simplify the work a little bit, we can say how wide and how high our whole grids can be for each of the five variations. It just makes it easier to change the look, if that grind a bit without doing it by hand. At the end we can mirror the whole thing comfortably with a mirror node, and have the matching polygons on the left and right side. Then I use a few values here to enlarge the object as a whole. Here it is quite helpful if you set the template flag here to see how the dimensions of the main cut object are. I just copy then the tubes and use also here the appropriate values in order to adjust the size of the tubes. The values I just used worked for me quite well. You can of course put in other values there, depending on how you want to have the cutting steps. I have here the value minus 10 divided by 3.5, and then also in the other direction so that my dynamic cutting tool cuts correctly. You can just copy and paste the whole block. I simply got here 5 steps in and have the range 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on, and the last row 30. We still need a cut ID, so let's assign them in the attrib wrangle nodes. Each one gets a unique number. We can see that we need here much more rows to the left and right, and luckily we can set this very comfortably with our tool we just made. Repeat the step for the other variations and set them to match the cut size. You can do this for all other variants. To do this, 
simply detach all nodes and then link them to the switch, because the switch will ultimately communicate with the node in the upper context and use the cut IDs to find the correct counterpart here. That means in the upper level we have to assign a cut ID for our curve as well, which we will also enter manually to limit the range. We could set the whole thing procedurally, so it would have adjust the size according to the general size of the edge or cut, but that would take a bit more effort, and that's why I just set it that way. So we need another attrib wrangle and a few channels that describe our minimum and maximum length, and then assign an ID for it. That means, for example, for the cut ID 0, we have then the minimum 5 to the maximum 10. Which means, for example, if we have a curve with a length between 5 and 10, we assign the ID 0. We do this in an if statement and say if the rest length is greater than the min and is less than the max, then the ID is 0, and we use this pattern for the other 5 variants too. We just need 7 more channels, and we are done here. I have noticed that we have no rest length on our curves. This is because we actually have no curves here but only points. In my master file I have full curves on which I have the attribute. I guess we could promote this to points and have the attribute on the points, but I would like to do this like in the master file. You never know why you did what you did. That means we shouldn't just make a point here in the middle of our curve. It would probably make more sense if we shrink both points by the same value, so that we are basically contracting our curve, and have then both points in the middle, and not deleting our curve. For this, we use a primitive properties and set transformation on, set the size to zero, and then we have here two points and a primitive on which our rest length lies, all at the same position. We delete the fuse because we don't want to melt the points, but we want to see if our testing depth network still works. This seems to be the case, but it also duplicates the test line because we now have twice as many points. This doesn't really matter because both curves are the same length but we want to have the whole thing a bit cleaned up and say that we merge the whole thing and end up with only one curve. Anyway, in the upper level, continue and work out the other cut variants of our channels. I am just copy and paste the channels here for the other length variations, updating each channel to have the right range and set my min and max values down here. Update our if statement accordingly, and we can copy and paste the whole thing here, then copy again three times for min and max. And in the last range, we will limit the whole thing to a certain value, and everything above that value should then be assigned the ID 4. This can of course lead to the fact that if we work with a curve, which is longer than we specify here, it will look a bit short for longer edges. But that is in principle the downside, if you do not work procedurally. Maybe in the future I will do a fourth part and then change the whole thing, so we are no longer dependent on the static values. But for now, let's make this working. Now we have, of course, to update the whole thing in our tool. That means that the switch node also uses the correct ID here. For this, we have to add an expression to the switch node, which uses the matched ID, which comes in from the upper level. Pay attention to the order in which the inputs enter the switch node, because these correspond, of course, with the ID. And if we have the ID 0, then, of course, the cut variant with the ID 0 should also be in the first place. Again, if you have not watched the tutorials on the expressions, you can check my channel where I explain expressions in detail. Perfectly, the switch node also works as we want it. It takes the fourth input automatically, and we can then simply duplicate the whole thing for the tubes because currently we have this only for the five different cuts, and we would now also need the grid sections that we have created with the tool. Here we can simply copy this, set it to the bottom, we shake the nodes so that we free them from the connections, then connect them directly to our tubes, and can also copy the switch node here have to set it to primitive again, so that this also works, and copy this, and also connect here accordingly to this variant. Then connect this output then with the copy to points node of the holes and see it works. To work comfortably, we need a null here that makes it easier for us to access the incoming polygon. We copy this, and paste it into an object merge to have access to it down here. We then need a bool node, where we can subtract our grid variant from our polygon, and we see that this already works quite well. Just change in the Boolean node from solid to surface to only intersect the polygon and not have another addition down here. We see that our cut variant also works, and we connect them together. Currently we have them overlapping, but we can solve this very easily by extruding one of them. Technically we have to extrude both, but we just start with our variant and add an output back here. To bevel the edge right away, we can create us an extrude front group that we can use. Make a poly bevel and then round up the edge.
Cool, that seems to work fine. Only adding some values in the distance and increase the divisions. On the other side, we have to extrude also the part with the holes. Because I want it to be underneath the main panel, I extrude the one with the holes down. Output also the back and reverse the vertices. So, next we need two more meshes to create. One for our round corners, and then one correspondingly for the screw holes. We go directly into the round edges, and solve the whole thing very quickly here by using a fuse node to melt our points. Then we will use a resample. For that we need a value as an input that we can use to have more control, like I do here. And link the resample input by copy and paste relative reference. And after the resample, we need an attribute blur that basically rounds the position. If you haven't done it yet, feel free to create two input variants again. One for resample and one for iteration. This will make it easier for you to set it at the higher level. To finish that, just add a facet node that helps delete points on straight edges called inline points here. Then we continue with the screw holes. The very first thing we do is go into the network and use a poly extrude to set the polygon inwards a bit here to use the points later. We can delete the geo with an add node, and we only keep the points. I use a peak node in here to correct the position of the points in Y. I just use the value of the poly extrude node and divide that by 2. The only problem I have now is that I don't have normals for the points, which means we can't use the peak correctly. We need the normals from our initial polygon. Actually, we only need a normal in the y-axis, but we want to have it procedurally and dependent of the rotation of our polygon. We could do it statically and say it's always 1 in y and 0 in x and z, but if we would have tilted polygons, it won't work properly. That's why we have to create this attribute again in the upper level. That means at the very beginning we need a normal node and bring the reference with an object merge, then get it into our screw hole network and refer to it. With an attribute copy where we carry our normals onto our peak points. Perfect, now we have the normals and can use them with the peak node. Next comes the tubes to copy. I just set some values here for the tubes, but feel free to change that if you want. Of course, you can also use this network to also copy the actual screws, only the points should be the same. The only thing you need is the, the screw itself. I think you get the point. Of course, other opportunities and variants are also possible here, like rivets, screws, nuts, all sorts of things that can relate to these holes. Another issue that we will face, unfortunately, and I've encountered the problem while working on that project, is when points are too close to each other. Then the tubes are intersecting, and the Boolean node will not work very well, or don't work at all. To solve this, I have created a tool to detect these intersections, and if there is an overlap, then deletes the corresponding object. And that is why we need another attribute that we call whole underscore ID. We need that attribute on points, because we have only points. But later after the copy to points node, we can easily promote that to primitives. You will see why in a minute. At this stage, you could not only check if there are intersections between the objects, but you could go directly and use the points, and try to determine if certain points are too close to each other, and then you can delete the points. It would make more sense in terms of efficient use of resources because you would skip the copy tubes thing completely, but I wanted to make myself independent of the objects, because if you have to keep track of the distance between the points that are allowed to touch each other, you need to specify how close the points could be depending, of course, on the radius of the corresponding tubes or objects that you use, and you need to build this dependency. So to get around this, I decided to simply take the objects and check if there is an overlap here. And if it is, then to solve this on the objects themselves. For this you need a for each number loop. That means one that goes through the objects as many times as you want and looks if there are intersections. The intersection analysis node is perfect for this. If it detects an intersection, points are created there. The way the tool then works inside is with two blast nodes, because I basically want to go through each object once, 
and compare that with the others, that means I need two blast nodes here. And namely, I want to delete the processed object based on the whole ID, and then I will copy the blast afterward, and then simply invert this selection so that I can let each individual object collide once with all the others. To do this, we want to exclude the currently processed whole underscore ID, based on the iteration we are on, deleting basically the tube with the matching ID and iteration. Then copy that blast node to delete the non-selected, having in principle every tube checked against the others of our panel. Now we have to gather all the information in our attribute wrangler, where we finally use the information and see if there is collision or not. I do this by checking if there are points in the intersect analysis, then compare the whole IDs, and if it is the same ID that we have here in the blast 1 and 2. And if there are points in the intersection node, then I want to delete the incoming object. Perfect. To check if the whole thing works, I can just create an edit node up here and manually move the objects around to get these tube intersecting. One small thing we have to change to make the whole thing work is to change the iterations. That means currently we have here 10 iterations and have to set this manually, but that must be set in dependence with the number of objects. And since we have also access to the points where we copied the tubes on, we just use the number of points. We write again a small expression here. Change the feedback at the end, and at the beginning, use the expression, refer to the location, add the name of our node, and here are the 28 points. That means we check here exactly 28 times. Perfect. Then we can connect the whole thing together, and see that it also works directly in the bool node. Connect that with the merge, and we can also output here again the group that is created by the bool, to apply a poly bevel. One thing is still missing and that is that I forgot to set in the tubes to have the caps closed. Provide the group in the B inside A, and we can also use this directly in a bevel enter here the group B, and then we can change the distance quite comfortably. To check if that all makes sense and works under all conditions we can select a few other polygons up here again. Maybe we add the ones above here and go all the way down to our node, check the display flag and see if the whole thing works. It takes a bit to calculate. Great, it's done. You made it that far. Congratulations to you. I hope you learned something along the way. I would appreciate if you comment or even subscribe to my channel. See you next time.